Hey y'all, welcome back. I'm sure you've heard of the term average annual returns. Unfortunately, the term is incredibly misleading. Average annual returns are a lie. In fact, you should almost never look at a fund's average annual return if you're trying to understand what to expect from your investment. It's so misleading, I will show you an example later of how the average return over a time period is positive, but investors actually lost money. And what makes this especially difficult for new investors is that many websites will use the term AAR or average annual return incorrectly. The yearly performance of a fund will be labeled AAR, but the number that they're actually using is the annualized return over the given time period, which makes a huge difference. In this video, we're gonna look at the difference between average returns and the annualized returns for an investment fund and the huge difference that it makes over many years. Let's get into it. The situation where you can expect this metric to pop up is when you are comparing investment funds, which is very common. Most people don't have the time or the expertise to construct their own diversified portfolio or research what companies are in a prime position to pull ahead or crash. So in that situation, it is wise to invest in a passive index fund or a hedge fund, but how do you pick a fund? Between index funds and hedge funds in the US alone, there are literally thousands. So naturally you wanna compare the past performance of different funds to see which one is best. Intuitively, most people that are new to investing will immediately think average returns. It just sounds right. You wanna know on average what you can expect. New investors who are not familiar with annualized returns are searching average return on Google. As a result, average return gets way more traction on investing websites and gets used incorrectly. As an example, let's look at the most popular index fund on the market, the S&P 500. When I type into Google, average annual return S&P 500, the very first result I get is a page from Nerd Wallet. After scrolling down a bit, we can see a table where they show the five, 10, 20 and 30 year average annual return. Normally this is great because you might wanna know what you can expect to make in a five year period or a 10 year period or a 30 year period, but the only issue is that they've not actually calculated the average annual return, they've calculated the annualized return. Here's an article from Investopedia titled S&P 500 average return, where they describe average annual return as a vital tool for investors, when in reality, it's incredibly misleading, and here's why. Everyone is familiar with averages. If you're looking at a marathon, whoever has the highest average speed will win the race. It feels like the same concept would work for investing. The fund with the higher average return should make me more money, right? Not the case. The higher average return does not always mean more profit. Average annual return fails when you are looking to hold that investment over multiple years and the investment can go both positive or negative. That is a huge problem because generally, when you are looking to invest in a hedge fund or an index fund, it's most likely a retirement account like a 401k or an IRA. These are investments that get held for decades and they absolutely have negative years from time to time. The problem boils down to this. Negative returns hurt your end result much more than it affects the average. The simplest example to illustrate this point is a fund that is two years old. In year one, the fund returns a staggering 100%. Then in year two, the fund loses 50%. When we calculate the average annual return, we do 100% minus 50%, that gives us 50%. Then divide that by two years, we get an average annual return, 50% divided by two years, that's 25%. That sounds amazing, right? You can probably see where I'm going with this. If we look at how this actually plays out, you end up making $0 after two years. Say you start out with $100. After that 100% return, you go up to $200. Should have sold then because after losing 50% the next year, 50% of $200, you're back down to your starting point, $100. This perfectly illustrates what I said earlier. A higher average return does not necessarily get you more profit. If you had put your money in a high yield savings account instead for two years with an average return of just 3%, you would have profited about $6 over the two years. In this case, an average annual return of 3% beats the average annual return of 25%. I can even show you a situation where the average annual return is positive and yet you lose money. Check this out. Just add one more year to the previous example. 
In year three, you lose another 20%. So year one, 100% gain, year two, 50% loss, and year three, 20% loss. That brings our average to 100% minus 50 minus 20. That's 30% over three years. That brings us to an average annual return of 10%. But in reality, after giving this fund your money for three years, you end up with a total loss of 20% from $100 down to $80. It's easy to see how misleading this metric is. Thanks for staying with me this long. If you're enjoying the video, please give this video a like down below. It helps me grow my channel and I would really appreciate it. So the question is, what metric should you look at? The answer is annualized returns. Annualized return calculates the constant return that you would need to get the same profit over the same amount of time. That way, the compounding nature of market returns can be accounted for. This is different from average annual returns, which really just tells you what you can expect to get on average in a single year of investing. Let's use the three year example from before, but this time we will use this equation for calculating annualized returns. Our starting value was $100, and then after three years, we ended up with $80. This results in an annualized return of negative 7.17%. Clearly, this metric more closely describes the reality of the three-year fund over the average annual return of 10%. But wait, there's more. Let's consider a fund that has an incredibly long history, like the S&P 500. This index fund has been around since 1926, nearly 100 years. Now you could calculate the annualized return over the lifetime of the fund, and that wouldn't be the worst thing. But if you look at this graph, you can see that even though the overall result is very positive, there are still long spans of time where you would see a negative return. For instance, if you invested at the height of the market in the year 2000, just before the pop of the dot-com bubble, it would be about seven years before the stock market returned to approximately the same level. Then in 2008, we had the housing crash and the market would take roughly five more years to recover after that. So if you invested one lump sum in 2000, you would go roughly 13 years with very little return. I say all this to illustrate that not all time periods are equal. Depending on the time period you look at, the annualized returns could be very different. Since you are presumably a mortal human who cannot invest for a whole century, you're gonna to wanna to know the probability of going negative for many years. This is where average annualized returns come into play. Let's say you wanna know what to expect should you invest in the S&P 500 for 30 years. You would calculate the annualized return for a 30 year period and you would do that for all of the 30 year periods in the history of the fund and then average them all together. On top of that, there are other valuable calculations that you can do with that information to give you a better picture. I'll put a link in the description for the website that I like to use for this. Not only will it do the annualized and average annualized calculations for you, but it will also calculate things like standard deviation and confidence intervals. Without getting into a whole lesson on statistics, standard deviation just gives you an idea for how much you can expect results to vary from the average. For instance, let's say you have two funds with the same annualized return, but one of them has crazy ups and downs. The crazy one would have a high standard deviation. The other fund is very consistent and goes up a little bit every year. That fund would have a very low standard deviation. If you were only gonna invest for a short period of time, the lower standard deviation would be a more reliable fund to invest in. The confidence interval calculation is a useful tool as well. It tells you how likely it is for you to exceed different levels of annualized returns over the time period you selected. Let's say you want to put some money in a given fund for 10 years and you plan to withdraw for an important purchase like a house. And you really don't want to risk going negative. You can use this calculation to determine how likely it is for you to lose money over that time span. If we look at the S&P 500, you can see historically 90% of all 10 year time spans exceeded an annualized return of 3.4%. This means that according to past performance, you have a 90% chance to make over 3.4%, which I think is very good. What percentage would you draw the line at when saving for an important purchase? Now don't confuse this with a crystal ball, but it is a good starting place for you to analyze your investing timeline. If you enjoy the video and want more content about making sense of the stock market, please be sure to check out this video where I go over stock market basics. Until next time.